All sporting events in this nation would be canceled. Restaurants would be closed. And if I wanted to order takeout, someone wearing a face mask and gloves would carry it to my car. And if you told me that hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans would be without work, and most of those who have work would be working from home, and if you told me that, that this would be true not only for Minnesota or, or the United States, but for countries throughout the world, and if you told me that, that this is because that there was some uh, virus that was infecting millions of people, like a kind of silent tsunami sweeping around this world, I would have dismissed what you were saying. Or I might have thought that you were describing a, a, a television series from my childhood that was being revived. Do you ever see The Twilight Zone? You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Writer and producer Rod Serling would begin each episode by describing a scenario that seemed plausible and at the same time seemed implausible. And he told us it's because we were entering into the Twilight Zone. But unlike the Twilight Zone, we don't know how this episode will end. You know, last week I was reading about how uh, Bill Gates had predicted a pandemic in a TED Talk that he gave five years ago, in which he described the, the kind of financial consequences that we're experiencing today. But, but who listened to that? Who believed that? Who took what he was saying seriously? And you know, I thought about that as I was reading the Gospel of Matthew. I mean, we have Jesus, this, this traveling rabbi from Galilee who, who proclaimed a, a new way of living, a, a, a new kind of kingdom unlike anything people had ever experienced before. And he gathered with him a group of, of 12 uh, misfits, and the only thing they seemed to have in common was was an attraction to the person and the message of Jesus. And for three years, Jesus taught, he healed, he got close to people that no righteous rabbi would ever touch. I mean, his actions alienated the most religious, and yet he brought a hope to the poor and forgotten that, that somehow they would be part of this new kingdom. And at several points along the way, Jesus said to his followers, the human one, that is, he's talking about himself, the human one, the son of man will be handed over to be crucified. But no one believed that. I mean, no one took him seriously. And so they're on their way. Jesus and his followers are on their way to Jerusalem. They knew that he would be the king and they would be part of this kingdom. And the Roman Empire would be defeated. Or so they thought. And, and you see, that's the, the undercurrent as this parade of peasants enters a gate into the city of Jerusalem. And when the people see Jesus on the back of a donkey, instantly they, 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 they understand the sign and, and they take branches from, from leafy trees and, and they bind them together, waving those branches and, and shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And at the same time, 
there was another procession that day that was entering the emperor's gate on the opposite side of the city. And that procession was led by the Roman governor named Pontius Pilate, a battalion of Roman soldiers with cries from the crowd that said, blessings on the one who comes in the name of Caesar. Two processions. Two kingdoms on a collision course that only Jesus had anticipated. Now, there's also a backstory to this scene. And to understand what's happening that day, let's go back to the fall of the year and the Feast of the Tabernacles. In the book of Leviticus, People were commanded every year at the fall harvest to build booths or, or huts. In fact, today there are people who still will, will, will build these booths or huts, still observing the, the, the feast of the tabernacle. It was a way of remembering how their ancestors had wandered in the wilderness and lived in such huts. And during the days of this Feast of the Tabernacles, they would read Psalms 113 to 118. And on the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would read Psalm 118, which is called the Great Hosanna. Because at verse 25, we find these words, Lord, save us. The Hebrew word, Hosanna. And then the people would take branches from leafy trees, from willow, myrtle, and palm, and they would bind them together, wave them overhead, and remember how they were once slaves in Egypt. But now they were set free. Hosanna! And they would walk around the temple and the synagogues, waving their branches, Hosanna! Deliver us, reign over us, be our king, Hosanna in the highest. Now one additional historical note. In 165 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes ruled over Israel from Syria. And he wanted the Jews to to worship the Greek gods, but the Jews rebelled. So Antiochus sent his troops, invaded Jerusalem, went into the temple, set up an altar, and sacrificed a pig on that altar to the Greek god Zeus. It was an act of humiliation, and the people were enraged. Now, there was a Jewish father with five sons who who led a revolt against Antiochus. That They went first to the temple, they cast out the Syrians, they cleansed the temple, they rededicated the temple to God. Now that moment is, is remembered each year in the Hanukkah. Now Judas Maccabee was the oldest of the sons. And when he returned to Jerusalem after fighting and, and pushing the, the, the Syrians out of Jerusalem, when, when, when Judas Maccabee entered the city of Jerusalem, the people took branches from leafy trees. They bound them together and they waved those branches shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. So when we read in Matthew that the people were shouting Hosanna, what kind of king were they expecting? They cleanse the city of the Romans, cast out the oppressors, restore the glory of Israel. I mean, what they were expecting was was a kind of processional that was happening on the opposite side of the city. But over the past few weeks, we've been learning that Jesus was announcing a very different kind of kingdom. 
a new way of living that lifted up the poor and the forgotten. I mean, it would be heaven here on earth. But the people did not understand that. And, and by Friday, the, the, the crowd that had been shouting Hosanna would shout crucify and turn away from God. Because God was not doing what they hoped. God was not answering their prayer, Hosanna. And you know, sometimes that still happens even today. I can come here hoping that God will give me what I want. But instead, what I've discovered is that God offers me what I need. And if I get that reversed, thinking that, that, that if I come, thinking that I come here because God will then give me what I want, it, it, Hosanna, only we don't get what we want, or, or even worse, we get what we don't want, it's easy for us to shout, crucify, and turn away from God. And yet if we turn away from God, we turn away from hope. We turn away from the only one who has promised to never leave us, never forsake us, never abandon us. We are living at a time that none of us fully understand. We are in the midst of circumstances that none of us want. And yet, several of you have sent me notes about how in the midst of all of this, you are receiving what you need. I mean, you needed time to slow down. You, you needed time to to, to focus on your family. You needed time to, to, to have an evening meal together. You, you needed time to sort out what was important and, and what your priorities are. Some of you have been sending me notes how you are connecting with family and friends, some of them scattered around the world in a way that you never would have if you've tried to continue the pace that your life was on. Others of you not sure where your next meal would come from. And then suddenly, food arrives at your doorstep. In the midst of circumstances that we don't want, we receive what we need. Now Matthew tells us that in the evening, Jesus goes to Bethany, a small town outside of Jerusalem where he has dinner in the home of Simon, who had a skin disease. Some translations tell us that he was a leper. Now, lepers had a skin disorder that was considered contagious. And those who were lepers were, were considered unclean. People were afraid of them that they were not permitted to enter the, the temple. They were not permitted to get close to other people. And if they were walking down the street and they saw another person approaching them, they were to shout, unclean, 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 so that people would stay away from them. Now, where does Jesus choose to spend his last supper before the last supper? in the home of a leper. I mean, Jesus touches lepers. Nobody did that. Jesus heals lepers. Nobody did that. Jesus shows compassion to everyone. You know, it makes me think of where we would find Jesus today. 
I think we see Jesus in, in the hallways of hospitals, in the back of ambulances, in the rooms of people who are sick with COVID-19. I think we see Jesus alongside healthcare workers who are on the front line, especially those who do not have personal protection equipment. See, Jesus is drawn to such places and to such people. There is no disease bad enough or suffering deep enough that will keep Jesus away. I mean, that's where we'd find Jesus today. So, so what does this tell us about kingdom living? What does this tell us about this, this Hosanna living? Jesus went to the home of a leper, and it was behavior like that that, that would put him on a cross. I wonder who will we reach out to in the name of Christ? You know, Amanda and I have lived in our neighborhood for almost 20 years. And last week while I was out walking our dog, I met people who also live in the neighborhood. And I was meeting them for the first time. I didn't even know they lived in our neighborhood. I mean, some of you have told me about how you've been baking cookies and bringing them to your neighbors. Or you left uh, flowers at someone's door. I wonder if this might be our mission field this week. I mean, with Easter approaching, what if you made an Easter basket? Or, or, or you prepared a plate of cookies, or, or, or it could be uh, an encouraging note that included this message. I mean, if you need a message of hope in uncertain times, try this on Easter. I mean, sometimes we... We don't want to be too forward. We don't want to be true, too intrusive. But who doesn't need a message of hope and encouragement these days? Many of you are watching this morning because you received an invitation. Sometimes our lives can be changed as a result of an invitation. Hosanna! Hosanna! Jesus was in the home of Simon the leper. And while he was eating, a woman approached Jesus carrying an alabaster jar. Now, alabaster was a kind of marble. It was expensive and beautiful, and this particular jar contained expensive perfume. I mean, it was, it was the kind of heirloom that would have been passed from generation to generation, used sparingly so that it would last as long as possible. But this woman opened her alabaster jar and poured its entire contents on Jesus' head. I mean, what a waste. I mean, just imagine if she had sold this alabaster jar, what the proceeds could have done for the poor. But I think what Matthew wants us to see is that in this one act, this woman has anointed Jesus as king and also prepared him for burial. You see, we stand between Hosanna and crucify. And which one will we choose? Which one will we proclaim? 
Jesus tells us, Jesus said, I tell you the truth that wherever in the whole world this good news is announced, what, what she's done, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. But who is she? I mean, Matthew never identifies her because I think her anonymity is the anonymity that we all share. I mean, we don't need to know her name. And she is remembered whenever we live and, and, and serve for the glory of God. And isn't that what Jesus expects of those who would be part of this new way of living, this kingdom that's breaking into this world? You know, I was sitting at my desk at home working on this message. And I happened to look up at this point and notice this picture that's on the wall beside my desk. It was painted by my daughter, Bethany, when she was eight years old. She gave it to me on Father's Day in 1994 with a note that read, I love you, Daddy. It's her self-portrait. So I would not forget what she looks like. And of all the paintings that hang in our home, this one is priceless. See, this simple act of honoring me and saying, I love you, Daddy. And I will never forget. See, at a dinner party where one, where there was one whom the world called unclean, we see an unnamed woman whose love for Jesus overflowed. And Jesus says he will never forget. And that's why I shout Hosanna. See, God loves me so much that, that when I come to Jesus... And I say, Lord, I love you. When I love God, when, when I love my neighbor as myself, when I do unto others as, as they would have me do unto them, it brings glory to God. And that's why I live, so that through me, others might catch a glimpse of this new way of living, this kingdom that continues to break into this world. Hosanna. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus, Messiah. You are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. Here I am at the start of this holiest of weeks, remembering your passion and death. Help me to see how your light continued and continues to shine. Even when we see around us, what we see around us is fear, uncertainty, and suffering. God, we confess to you our need for hope. A hope that we know will come once again on Easter. So in these days ahead, give us a measure of courage minute by minute and day by day to live knowing that the worst thing is never the last thing. And no matter how tough the circumstances of our lives may be, you will walk with us. You will hold us with a love that will never let us go. We pray this day for safety for doctors, nurses, and first responders who are risking their own health to care for others. 
We pray that our leaders and officials will have wisdom in the midst of difficult decisions. We pray for those who worry about their employment and their finances and their health and and the impact these next weeks and months will have on their families. Empower us, dear Lord, to be your instruments of healing and hope in this world of need. My Lord and my God, at this cross I I humbly offer my life to you. Use me. Use this church to extend mercy and love to others. As a people who are scattered in many different places, we now lift our voice to you with the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.